So let's start at the beginning. How was it growing up blue water? Well, interesting, because of the pictures you just saw, it wasn't anything to start with. It was out of our garage. It was a little sailboat. That's how it all started, one little sailboat. I thought this would be an interesting spot to do this interview. The bulkhead right behind me, the house behind me, was Blue Water Yacht's first waterfront location. Um, Chris kept a couple of deep draft sailboats up here at that time. Uh, it was it was quite a neat deal. Well, my story with Chris began on this creek, and I was coming down in my John boat, as we did a hundred times a day back then, and we wanted to come down and see this new place that was going up, this new guy that was moving on the creek, and see what kind of interesting stuff we were going to get to play with. Name is Smokey Glover. I have known Chris and Earl over 50 years. I met Chris in 1972. Earl and I go back to the second grade, which was a few years prior to that, and uh, I boated with them, boat raced with them, worked at the yard, and been close friends for many, many years. Yeah, my name is Gordon Edwards. I was in the, my first real job was in the boat business, working for Columbia Yacht Corporation. Uh, Chris, back in that time, was a food broker. Chris got this inkling that he wanted to get involved racing sailboats. He was, he was around boats all his life, so he wanted to get into sailboats. And I said, well, if you want to race, there's only one boat to get. That's a Cal 25. Well, at the time, the dealer for the Cal was down at Virginia Beach, and they stored one boat behind Pete Smith's surf shop because one of the two co-owners was the owner of, of uh, Pete Smith's surf shop. And uh, so Chris ended up buying a boat and he kept it in his yard and he ended up buying the dealership from these guys and that's where he got started in the boat business. My name's Ed Morris and I was the first employee of Blue Water Yacht Sales. Uh, in 1970, I believe it was September, I started and uh, we, uh, we did fairly well. I think my first sailboat sale, actual sale, other than Chris selling it, because he was quite a salesman, was a Cal 20 to a German fellow. We had Henry Hudgens working for us and uh, Herb Hux, and we were all kind of boat nuts, and we made it work, and it was, it was good fun. And, uh, we eventually, we had all this big, large ship type machinery for working on doing woodworking and things and uh, we used all of that and w nobody was hurt, nobody was killed. <laughs> so uh, that, that, that worked out very good. I'm Henry Hudgens and I was the third employee at Blue Water Yards. I went away to school and came back and lived in Portsmouth at the time and Chris kept his boat at Tide Water Yard. And uh, I was walking the piers one day and saw him, and we were, our, our families had been friends forever. And we just started chatting, and he invited me to go sailing with him, and we started racing his sailboat, and that's where it all began. It was me, Ed Morris, and Chris. And uh, Ed would do sails as well as help me out in the back in the beginning. And then we got some more people involved. Hi, I'm Donald Heath. I worked at Blue Water from 79 to 85. They started me out as a truck driver, but if I wasn't truck driving, they would uh, let me work in the yard. I ran a travel lift, I worked on engines, pretty much whatever needed doing, I, I did. Probably started with Blue Water when I was about 15, probably about 1970 or so. And at that time, they were totally in the sailboat business. Um, my brother was the first employee there. And uh, we installed the mast. We did full outrigging on, on new sailboats. And we did that behind Chris Hall's house over in, uh, at Hatton, Hatton Point in Portsmouth, Virginia. We know you've been here since the beginning, but at what point did you say, I'm ready to come on full time? Well, I think it started um, in the early days of Blue Water. A lot of Chris's boat sails with the Cal sailboats were occurring in Fishing Bay, which is about 45 miles north of Hampton. Um, 
kind of where the Piankatank River and the Rappahannock River come together. And so I would ride with him on weekends and we would go up there either to meet a customer or to bolt on a winch or do whatever. Um, so there was a lot of windshield time going back and forth between Portsmouth and Fishing Bay. And so there, there never was like a day that it just clicked. It, as I said, it was an evolution where um, it went from riding up there on the weekends to summer job to um, eventually, I'll, I'll never forget, I was supposed to be going to college at Virginia Wesleyan. And one day I'm sitting in traffic trying to go through the downtown Portsmouth Tunnel. And I really didn't want to go to school. And I really wasn't happy to be in the traffic. So at the next exit, I got off and I went to Henry Waterback's race boat shop where our race boat stayed and worked on the race boat that day. And then the next thing you know, um, I had a meeting at Chris's house when he lived in Portsmouth. And he said, why don't you come full time at Blue Water? And so that was 42 years ago. Blue Water is celebrating 50. This would be my 30th. You know, came to Blue Water when I was uh, basically 30 years old and uh, been here ever since. I came in the late 80s and uh, we've been through lots of different boat lines and lots of different locations and iterations, but, uh, but it's always been about one thing. It's always been customer service and uh, selling the best. My name is Craig Messick and I'm the yard manager here at Blue Water and happy to be part of the 50th anniversary of Blue Water. Um, and next February I'll be celebrating my 30th year at Blue Water. So I've been here from, for a lot of it. Uh, the first time I met Chris, I, I didn't really know who he was, but my dad was a uh, building inspector for the city of Hampton and was on one of his routes one day and saw a Hobie cat on Bridge Street for sale. So we came up that weekend after I put my money together and came up and bought a Hobie cat from Chris when I was 14 years old. Didn't really want anybody to know that I ever had a sailboat, but I did. <laughs> it was very involved. We uh, were there, I lived in Norfolk and we had I commuted to Hampton uh, when we bought the place in Hampton, uh, uh, downtown Hampton. and. Uh, it was a long time. We, we started around 8 o'clock and we would finish whenever, so it became a lot of late nights and uh, because of the schedules and putting boats together uh, and people's, the customers wanting their boats as soon as possible, we also worked a lot of weekends. Uh, I, start, I remember actually putting together a Columbia 45 motor sailor. We were actually delivering it to uh, Annapolis, Maryland in December and it was snowing and blowing hard and I think I was up the mast part of the way installing gear. So it, that's what you had to do. We did what we had to do. Uh, it was a good time. Boats were moving back then. And you might say, and I'm sure Chris really had researched, he knew what he was getting into. And he knows when to move with the market. That's why he went from sailboats to fiber, because sailboats really fell off and dropped off the, the edge of the earth, so to speak. But he's been very successful because he reads the market, knows the market, and, and goes that way. He did know that. He knew exactly what he was doing. And uh, I'm sure he didn't know exactly when to go, but he knew the trend was going that way into power boats. And uh, he went with it, and it, as it turned out, it was the right time. Well, Chris has always been pretty driven, so I, I knew something good was going to come of it, but uh, this was beyond my wildest imagination, what he's done. Uh, he's always had a knack for when it was time to change or time to do something, he, he did it. I mean, I know he had some hard times there. He, he did come across a few times saying, things are tight, you know, we gotta tighten up here. I can't go like I used to, but then, you know, things would pick back up again and get going. So he, he always got, a, got it through the bad times, I guess you'd say. I think everybody everybody keeps working. Everybody enjoys what they're doing. All uh, you know, they're they're hands on with the boating, and uh, everybody just enjoys it so much. Chris Chris has always been on the water as for the 50 years I've known him, um, and and everybody around him, you know, kind of picks up with that energy that he has for. Uh, you know, being on the water, enjoying yourself, 
you know, making friends that uh, are, are, it's more than just buying a boat or having a boat in the yard. It's, it's a whole lifestyle that, uh, that he lives every day. He loves it. Well, I think, I think Chris and Earl both are, you know, all in for Blue Water. You know, it's whatever, if we're working on something and we need something to get the job done, there's no hesitation to, to get what we need to accomplish whatever task we're doing. And, you know, there's no, there's no shortcuts in what we do. If we need it, we get it. Went to uh, Key West with Chris and, Chris and Judy and Judy's mother on a 65 Hatteras one time, I guess. First time I'd ever gotten anybody a beer at 10 o'clock in the morning. First time I ever had a fried bologna sandwich. <laughs> I always tried to get him to go in the truck with me on a trip, and he never would go with me. <laughs> it all started right back here on this creek, on this creek bank. I watched him build that bulkhead. I watched him put the pilings in. I watched him bring these sailboats in that nobody thought would fit up in the creek, but they came in here, and it was cool. It was fun. Uh, one of the first times that I came up here, and Chris was out in the backyard working, getting stuff done, it was still a mess back there, no bulkhead or anything, no landscaping. And this was the first day that I met Ed Morris. And Ed being full-time employee of Blue Water at that time, and I think uh, Ed was kind of scratching his head too. What have we gotten ourselves into here? Standing out here in the dirt and the mud and wondering what we're gonna do. A lot of piled up dirt and everything out here and Chris was talking about he needed to get it leveled out and all. Well, not long before that, he had picked up a Galaxy Tunnel Hall ski boat, and we just thought that thing was like the space shuttle. I mean, we just walked around it in awe. So, I conjured up a deal that um, I'll come over here with a tractor and a blade, and I'll level this thing out, but I want to drive that boat down the creek. Okay, we can do that. We can do that. So, we came over here, and we worked a couple afternoons, and we got the backyard knocked down pretty good. And um, always seemed to be a reason that either the boat was not uh, ready to run or he wasn't available or something was going on and then the boat got sold. Um, never got the boat right and, and it's not that I feel like Chris was trying to um, not give me his end of the deal he just hadn't gotten around to doing it yet so um, I guess the, the boat ride down the creek in the tunnel boat has probably turned into a cruise around the bay on a Viking now so uh, but we'll, we'll get that sorted out I'm not worried about that. We've sold over 30 brands since the start of Blue Water. We've weeded through quite a few different brands through the years. I think our family of brands right now is probably the highest quality of any boat brands that any dealership in the United States has. I mean, Viking, our long-term relationship with them, which will be 35 years next year that we've been selling Viking yachts. Regulator, been selling them for 18 years this year. Sabre, Back Cove, Princess, all top of the line, as good a quality boat as you can buy. We don't have to make excuses for the brands that we sell. That's a wonderful thing. We're very proud that the manufacturers that we represent are top of the line in the, in the business and uh, it makes it a lot easier. They did it the right way. Uh, being owners of all of their facilities, uh, and building a service network. You know, that was something that Earl, you know, Chris stayed focused on the, the marina side, developing the marinas, the slip side, and Earl stayed incredibly focused on the service side. And having two, as my uncle would say, two different sandboxes. Chris was in his, Earl was in his, and they did an a incredible job together to build Blue Water where it is today. Our relationship with Blue Water and Chris and Earl started over two Regulator 23s that they purchased for their personal use. And uh, we got to know them and to work with them and uh, the reputation that they had in the late 90s when we were dealing with him. I think they bought those boats in like 97. Uh, when we started dealing with him was an incredible reputation and to have uh, people of the caliber of Chris and Earl to, to purchase a regulator is something that we 
that we were striving to do then and we're striving to do today and um, just incredible people and that's I keep using that word because when we were as we've worked with them through the years and our relationships have had ups and downs if there have been any disagreements Chris would always say let's sit down and talk about it and he would come to this place and we would sit down and we would talk about it and at the heart of what we do is that we are friends first and we are business associates second and I'm guessing that most people that you talk to about Blue Water and uh, especially uh, Chris Hall are going to say those same things we're friends first and then we're business partners and associates so an incredible group of people well, I think Chris, like a lot of other boat dealers, are very passionate about what they do. And the danger with most boat dealers, frankly, is that they get over exuberant and go out and blow it all up all at once. And Chris has ramped his business up slowly, built it up to an amazing level with all the professional staff he has and all the facilities that they have. And he's just managed his business up to a point now where they're looking for more growth in a very, very active market. That's the beauty of Blue Water. They've got it's a family-owned and structured business that's closely held. They've got local banking arrangements, and they've got good people that work financially with them. And uh, you know, the, the the leverage is what kills boat builders. And Viking yachts and Saber yachts are two of the best, most profitable boat builders in the business because they're privately held and not leveraged. Yeah, Chris and I met a couple times earlier on when I was still in banking because we we were involved in uh, the marine industry. And then later on we met, I think we had a casual conversation at the Annapolis Boat Show in 1983 about possibly getting together and Chris becoming a uh, biking dealer. Well, we they always had a reputation for running a top shelf service operation. And that was, that was a big uh, selling point to biking because biking put a lot of value into that with with clients so the halls have I've watched over the years is they've always reinvested in their business and allowed the business when they had the opportunity to grow it they they would allow it to grow and and, and sometimes would kind of boot it in the rear to get it to grow when times maybe weren't as good Blue Water has done so much right, but I think that the thing that they have done exceedingly well, and it's why they're surviving, and it's why they're a premier operation, is relationships. Chris and Earl, and then developing their team, are people, people. They love people. They love the relationships. It's not. It's not about selling a boat, it's about a relationship. And there's still a relationship after the boat sold. It's a relationship with vendors. Uh, it, it's relationships with people in the industry. Uh, wh whether it's a, a, a detailer at Virginia Beach or somebody that sold engines in some of their boats years ago, they still have all those relationships and they just tend to know everybody and they, they treat everybody like family. They really do. Uh, as a manufacturer, I got to work with a lot of dealers. At one time I had as many as 60 different dealers around and uh, Chris and Earl Hall is what made Blue Water Yachts uh, special. They were special people, they were honest, uh, straightforward, I always did what they said they were going to do and were well thought of by all of their customers. When problems ever arose, and we didn't have a lot of them, but when we did, it's always better to be dealing with people that know what they're doing and I put Chris and Earl Hall at the top of the list of people that knew what they were doing. You know, being in the marine business takes money. And Chris and Earl are always uh, investing money back into the business, uh, into the locations where they sold the boats, into the locations where they uh, serviced the boats. And uh, they invested back into their business as much as anybody I know of in the marine industry. It's a joy doing business with them. We're, we're doing on some of the new lines they have. Uh, they have Volvo engines in them, and uh, we're the uh, local Volvo franchise and uh, franchisee. And uh, so 
Earl said, I'm glad you're doing that because now I don't have to worry about it. So it's, it's that sort of relationship that we have together that uh, uh, makes, makes me feel good when I'm with them. Well, it's, it's when, you, when you ride around there and go to the, marine, the new marina they have there and the, the restaurant and the, uh, the repair facilities they have there, they're all first class facilities and uh, it it's kind of reflects their personal demeanors. They, they only do things the right way. It takes strong management and well capitalized as well. You mentioned that earlier. But uh, it takes people that are there when they have to be there every every day. Uh, you know, in in, in the, the sport, particularly in the sport boat business, uh, they're constantly uh, tournaments and all the way up and down the East Coast and uh, shoot offs between other manufacturers and Viking and all of that. And, and when when you see those things going on, you always see the uh, either Earl or Chris there and and or the people from their staff, so uh, it's not a Monday, it's Monday to Friday job, it's, a, it's a around the clock, seven days a week. Blue water boats, they use boats, they fish boats, they know boats, they know customers, they know the problems that the customers have, and if they get a call from a customer that says, gosh, I'm, I'm broken down, I'm a so-and-so, it's, what am I supposed to do? We'll be there, just hang tight. We'll be there, we're gonna send these people. Uh, they take care of the customers. What do you get? You get a repeat customer. Uh, they are not dealers that are looking for the guy that, or gal that's shopping for the lowest price on the East Coast of the United States. That's not their customer. They're looking for somebody that, that recognizes the quality and the operation that should match the quality of the manufacturer. But uh, those that are most successful in taking care of those customers are going to be the ones that, uh, that have a history that also have an employee base with seniority and that they have. Let me take a look at Judd. Take a look at Earl. Earl started as, as a kid working with Chris. It's like they, like they said one time, I think it's even in uh, some of their literature, that if, if uh, Chris couldn't get back in the hole to turn a wrench, then they, he'd send Earl because he was younger and smaller. Uh, and now they've tied into uh, Jarrett Bay. They have folks like Jan uh, that's been with Randy for some time. And they're, they're class people, they're quality people. They know the industry, they know the products they sell, they work closely with the dealers. People have to understand that the dealer is, is part of the manufacturing team, as the manufacturing team is part of the dealer team. They have to work together. Some manufacturers look at, at dealers as a necessary curse. You take someone like the uh, like the Halls at Blue Water, they add to any dealer organization. They make that good organization a little bit better because they're a notch above, giant notch above. Well, Blue Water's done right for, since the first year you know, in business is they've treated customers right. They've built relationships with people across the board. Uh, customers, employees, friends, other people in the boat business, they build a reputation of trust, a reputation of of I'm going to be there through the recession, I'll still be there to service you after. Even before the merger, both companies were very strong financially. You know, Chris has been extremely successful in his life in everything he's ever done. And anytime you have an opportunity to merge with somebody that's, that's, that's been a, a success through the food business, through the sailboat business, through the boat manufacturing business, through the boat selling business, and you can get on board and be part of that team and be a, a partner in that team, you know, it's, it's really an unbelievable experience. Well, from the very beginning, Blue Water's always been invested. You know, they've always invested in marinas, invested heavily in boat yards, and invested in the ways of service their customers. You know, as we've seen technology change and the way people shop for boats change. Uh, you know, before the internet, people actually had to come and look at the boat to understand what they were going to buy. Now, many times, the customer is every bit as well-versed as the salesperson when they come to the, to the sales office to see the boat. To a sales organization, the service footprint is critical. I mean, it, we see a lot of people in the sales business, and I don't want, I'm not, certainly not casting stones, that don't have any uh, service. Some have very limited service. When you look at the footprint Blue Water has, uh, three service yards, nearly 300 people, um, we can service you 
more quickly and more efficiently and get you back on the water as fast or faster than anybody in our industry. I love the relationships. I love spending time with my partners. I love hearing the stories. I love being with our salespeople. I love the camaraderie about it. I also really enjoy meeting customers. I really enjoy building the relationships with them. And, and you know, you hear cliches a lot, but truly becoming part of their family, where you know what their kids are doing, you know where their wife's at, you know what they enjoy, and have an opportunity to see them regularly. I think Chris has, um, he's an excellent salesperson and he has good mindset. He understands the industry. He has a great banking relationship with his banks, which is very important. In those times, in 2008, banks were shutting down floor plan everywhere and because of Chris's relationship with his bank. Um, it just made it so much simpler for him, I'm sure, to get through the recession. But also, he has a good feeling. I mean, he when he says something, it's kind of I, I kind of question it, and then I always say he's always right. And he's always right in his opinions and his thought process because he's been in the business for so long. I mean, he's 50 years in this business, so he understands what is right and what's going to happen. He has a vision for the next step. Well, I think there have been a number of issues on the economic front. If you were in the recreational business, whether it was in boats or motorhomes or whatever, whatever it may be, and uh, I think that the one thing that was always steady with Chris is that uh, his customers were his friends and his friends were his customers, and I think that, uh, that uh, he worked with people to get them out of uh, things when they needed to get out during the tough times, and, and conversely, a lot of his friends worked with him to get him out of things that he needed to get out of during the tough times. So, uh, I would characterize uh, uh, Chris's business as being one built on friendships and relationships, and, and I would say Chris's relationships and friendships are deep and wide, and uh, everybody needs help from time to time, and uh, Chris both provided help to people and received help from people. I met Chris and Earl in 1985 at the Big Rock Tournament in Moorhead City. Uh, at the time, I was the Made on the Viking 48 demo. Uh, my brother was the captain, my twin brother Drew, and I believe we were 19 at the time. And it was interesting because Chris had questioned um, Pat Healy, you know, is this the right choice to have two teenage kids running our demo program? And here we are 30 plus years later, um, and it's worked out quite well for all of us. Uh, we've had great success together. We've had a long-term friendship, a partnership that has developed um, that I truly cherish and uh, would consider, certainly consider Chris and Earl and Chris Jr. family. We've insured their business operations uh, for about 20 years now. And, um, you know, the, <laughs> Their bills are paid on time. They're, they're, the condition that they keep their facilities is outstanding. Uh, you know, we we have people that do inspections on their property. Uh, so all of that, uh, they keep, they run a first class facility. And uh, that's reflected in obviously their financial strength. Even when we went through some difficult periods, uh, it never changed. And, uh, you know, to this day, uh, as I indicated, we have written or provided their insurance uh, policies um, for 20 plus years. And, you know, that loyalty and the, um, you know, the number or, or the, the, the way that they value relationships, uh, is that's a testament to the long-term relationship that we have had. And, you know, that's also reflected in the relationships that they have with their customers. My name is Charlie Huffman. I'm an attorney in Newport News. I met Chris probably 40 or 45 years ago um, as I was looking for a boat and he was a boat dealer and I've dealt with Chris um, not only on boats but everything from cars, motorcycles, real estate, um, houses, you name it. Uh, when Chris is ready to do away with something he generally calls me and um, and the, and the products that he has and the things that uh, he's been involved in have, have certainly been beneficial to me and things that I've purchased from him over the years. And Chris is not a person that is going to do it one way and never change or modify. He's very aware of the market, he's very aware of the business, and he certainly has a good relationship with other brokers that he deals with, 
and I think he understands that sometimes consolidation and expansion of the business is almost necessary if you want to continue to compete. Hello, I'm Charles Barker. I'm a chairman of Charles Barker Holdings, which uh, as most of you may know is automobile dealerships and real estate here in Hampton Roads uh, for the most part. Well, I mean, we go back a long way. I guess my relationship with, with Blue Water is probably 30 years old, uh, you know, and with some smaller boats and some yard work and things like that. And I first, my first Viking was a 58 Viking that they did a lot of work for me on, uh, you know, back probably 1985 or something, I think. I can't remember when. So since then, I've had, you know, a 65, a 72, uh, I mean, a 74, an 82, and uh, now a 92 and in between a couple other custom boats but uh, I always seem to be coming back to Blue Water and, and back to Viking. Well I think like any company starting out new you know, if you started out in 1968 which is 50 years ago I mean it was a very turbulent time for anybody to start in business with the uh, Vietnam War, and civil rights movements, assassinations like Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. That's a tough year to get started but there's always been something else coming every year that we have to deal with as business people and, and Chris and uh, leading that ship has done a great job you know just like things like recessions we've been through wars strikes uh, the biggest thing they've had to deal with probably of all times was a luxury tax which uh, just about broke all boat manufacturers and, and, and boat suppliers and builders I think Chris um, is a lot like me or other people that have been around doing this this long you got to make quick decisions you got to make tough decisions uh, I've often said uh, the roads are paved with flat squirrels. Flat squirrels being they couldn't decide which way to go. You have to decide which way to go. And you have to stick to your guns and you have to see it through. Well, I think in any investment, whether you make it's in brick and mortar or technology or again, investment in people training, those who invest in the future are the ones that are going to be here in the future. Uh, those who don't invest will see themselves go by the wayside because you have to make these investments uh, every every year in something new that's coming. Our business is always changing. Business just being business, always changing. And those who change, even though you're doing the best, you got to do better than what you just did. You always have to be looking for the next level. And the only way you get there is through making positive changes. Viking and Blue Water to me are like a family, and uh, so I, I kind of feel like I'm somewhat part of that family because I can call any one of them at any time, and I think I'm going to get heard and listened to, and we're going to decide how we can we can handle our problem, our issue. The Blue Water, uh, go back to the family aspect of it. I think everybody in their family is involved, uh, not day to day, but it's it's a family affair, and uh, you know, with with Denise and, and you know Judy, they, they've been behind these guys and, and Judd's wife, they've been behind these guys day in day out. You don't make it without your family being behind you. It's a lot of time and trouble and a lot of things, a lot of unexpected, hey honey I can't come home tonight for this, that or that other reason or I'll be home at 10 instead of 5. So all those things are important ingredients to balancing a successful business and having it last this long. Being in business for 50 years is very, very special, especially when you do it so long with, with a lot of your partners. And doing it with Chris and Earl, you know, they were both skinny and had a full head of hair. And now, I work on them every day, work on them every day, because the biggest thing is, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. They're not done, we're not done. We're going to rewrite the chapter again and again and again. The Blue Water and Viking book is this thick. It will be that thick in the future. Because what we do, we all love what we do. And when you love what you do, you put your heart and your soul into it. You build the very best. And what allows us here at Viking to go and spend $13 million a year in our R&D budget to make new products is knowing that our partners at Blue Water are standing there developing their business and pushing their business forward to help us achieve what we need to achieve. And having Chris and Earl over 30 some plus years doing it is incredible to have that relationship. And um, they're brothers, they're my brothers. And, and that's what how we address it. Like I said, our families do everything together. And uh, we are family, the Healy's and the Blue Water Hall boys. I've, 
I never thought that I would make so many friends. I mean, you know, customers, employees, vendors. I mean, it, it, it's overwhelming what 50 years has, has provided. The knowledge, the, the, you know, the enjoyment, the, the, the ups, the downs, the sorrows. I mean, it's been a tremendous experience. And so I would say that when I started the company, I never had a vision of, of, what, of what I was going to see along the way and, and what was going to become of all that. It was um, more mom and pop, more it was smaller. Um, he had the one location at that time um, over on Bridge Street and it was friendly, it was family, it was nice, you knew everybody in there. A different, much simpler, I think, you know, operation then because um, he was still working in another business really at, at that time so um, it wasn't anything to what he has grown it to be. Uh, but it, it seems like, it, it feels like that it's, it's just been a gradual progression. Nobody ever stopped to think about it, that it just kind of evolved into what it is. But if I'm really giving that some thought, I would have to say it's evolved that way because of course it's vision. To me, Blue War being young was always very big, but in reality, it wasn't very big. But through the years, I mean, I remember we did our first national magazine ad that was then we were big. Uh, and then it just grew and grew and grew. And you know, when I was a kid, my dad worked and worked and worked. He's always working. He's still to this day always working. He was always selling, always selling. He didn't even realize he was selling, he was selling. That's kind of the neatest thing about my dad and I find I'm doing that too. I'm in a restaurant. I'm not thinking about selling somebody a boat, but I'm kind of trying to sell somebody a boat and that's what he does. No, there was no plan. I mean, what happened was I bought, uh, and some of these guys are still living and they're friends of mine. They might shoot me for saying this, but what happened was they were, they funded this business out of their hip pocket. So we had no bank relationship, no floor plan, no line of credit, no nothing. So when my boat came in, they had to pay for it in order for it to ship. And so they turned to me and they made me part of the business if I would pay for my own boat. So that's how I got in there. That wasn't much of a plan. But there was a plan when I saw that they had no plan, that that wasn't the kind of business that I wanted to be involved with. So they were very quick to understand that uh, they weren't willing to do what we initially did, and that was to start buying product for inventory and promoting product, which you know, we had a pretty small business plan, but we did have a plan. Um, I'd say there were Two, there, there are two periods in the evolution of Blue Water where I felt like we had uh, we'd arrived, if you will. The first was undoubtedly when we added um, Viking and Hatteras to our, to our product mix. We'd, uh, we'd grown up from brands like Topaz and Uniflight to the big leagues at that point. And so when you walked into the Miami Boat Show representing that product, you were in the big leagues. The next, uh, the next and, and last huge milestone that I remember with it was when we announced the merger of Blue Water and Jarrett Bay. Um, we, our first boat show was the Annapolis show after that announcement because we did it October 1st, six years ago. And with the branding that, uh, that Robin and Stealth Marketing had put up at that boat show and the banners and the uh, the things that the customers had to walk under walking down the dock and all the flag banners and it, and it was it was dozens and dozens of them and and that probably was the biggest moment where I said gee we've this is this is pretty big um, I do remember one interesting thing is that my mother was very concerned with uh, later on when Chris made the decision to go 100% boat business and get out of the food business was uh, she told him she said people always need to eat they don't always need boats so there have been some times in the tough times and he and I both remembered that quote well the initial struggle was that we were a paper business so to speak we were running running space to, to show the boats we we had to sell the bank on loaning us money to to buy the boats in an unknown business uh, the our blue water business and plus the industry 
was still in its uh, early days. And so I think every day was a challenge, but it's kind of what made it fun. You know, it, it's, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to put a finger on it, but it's, I mean, so many of it, uh, the things that we thought were the end of the world issues, you know, we laugh and smile about today, but they're real and they're, they're walls you gotta climb. And so you do, but you, you don't think of it as, as being a great challenge. You just think of it as being today's job or today's mission, so. Well, if you make a lot of decisions, hopefully more good than bad, I would say that the, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the brands that we've associated ourselves with, um, Chris's foresight to suggest to Judd and I that we abandon Hatteras and focus solely on Viking in our big boat line. That proved to be a great decision. It was a scary one, but um, it proved to be a great decision. I think the, uh, the construction of the Blue Water Yachting Center, which was a big financial commitment and a big undertaking, um, that turned out to be a good decision. The, uh, the growth in the Wanchies Seafood Industrial Park, which is now the Wanchies Wanche Marine Industrial Park, turned out to be a good decision. Um, you know, mostly the, the people we've aligned ourselves with, the merger with Randy and Jarrett Bay, turned out to be a great decision. So we won't mention the bad ones. Obviously one of the biggest things was the move from sailboats to strictly powerboats in the early 90s. That was a big move. We all thought that this isn't going to work. We were sailboat people. That's what we knew. We weren't powerboat people. Uh, Obviously a wonderful decision to move in the direction that he moved Blue Water. There's also been places that we've purchased that we thought, well, that might not work. When he bought the marina we're located at here in Hampton now, we all thought he'd lost his mind. He had a vision. We didn't think that vision was ever going to come to fruition, but within six years it had, and it's a, a wonderful vision he had, and I think he made it come to fruition. I remember one time when he was buying the current larger marina, I said, oh, do you really want to do this? I said, you know, we're so happy, we're comfortable like we are. You know, I, I really don't see any purpose in doing this at all. And he said, well, I, I just want to do it. He said, I think it needs to be done, I just want to do it. And it was a great thing. A lot of our decisions were good ones um, because we did do our homework. You know, we didn't just do a leap of faith. I mean, but all of them still take a lot of a lot of gut wrenching and but you know, I found out that if you don't feel good about something, you probably shouldn't do it. And if there's any one guiding point to what we've done historically, it's been that if it, if we felt good about it, we did it. If we didn't, we didn't. And we might have missed some opportunities. But I I'd like to think that if we made a um, hundred decisions and ninety of them were fortunately right then we did the right thing. But if we'd only made one and it hadn't have been the right one, we wouldn't have gone anywhere. <laughs> Working with families though is a, always an evolution. Um, we're, we're a high strong family. You know, we're all type A. And you put a bunch of type A's in the room together and, and some days are great and some days aren't so great, but we're, we're, we're all working for the common goal. And, and so that, that's a very settling thought, that we all are working for the common goal. We don't always agree on how we get to the end zone, but we're all trying to get to the end zone. Well, you know, family is probably one of the greatest assets we have because the old saying that no one looks after it like family, I mean, when Judy became involved in the business, I think we realized early on she had previously taught school and run a restaurant bar operation. So now she's deeply involved in the day-to-day -day dealing with the customers and working the boat shows and the fishing tournaments. And we would hash it out 12 hours a day and then go home and until we put a head on the pillow, we were involved in the same thing. And we realized that how dangerous that can be. And it's the same with a brother or a son or anyone in family in the business that you can depend on your family and all of the the assets that go with that that we all know um, and it is somewhat difficult at times 
to deal with family because you do expect more and you expect them to think like you think when they don't and rightfully so. So I think I think we've been very we've gotten along very well. Um, certainly we've had times where we don't agree on things but you know, I think the old saying about if you always demand perfection that ultimately you're probably going to get it a lot of times. So showing family and key people what's going on and what we can learn from and giving them outside opportunities I think has helped us. Um, you know whether, it, whether it's seeing how someone's doing it better or something in another industry that might relate to ours. But the loyalty and and closeness of family is a good thing. So I think that's been an asset for us. Well, like any teenager, I guess I wanted to be away from the house, even though mom and dad were awesome. They were mom and dad, and I guess every kid after about 12 years old wants to venture out on his own. So I spent an awful lot of time at Chris's house messing around with boats with him after he got off work. And we, um, we did a lot of boating in a 13 Boston whaler. He'd get home and get a cooler with a couple beers in it and we'd go for a boat ride. I wasn't drinking the beers. But, you know, hanging out with him, I think formed a lot of the, the good traits and maybe some of the bad traits that are in me because all I knew is what I knew from him. So I did things like he did things, work ethic, ideas, um, a drive to be good or, or even better than good to be the best and so I, I think all that came from hanging out with him one of the funny stories that I remember about uh, Chris and I working together in, in Blue Water and Blue Water's growth right after we became a powerboat dealer he and I were doing some boat deliveries together um, two very different types of boats he was in a, a fountain boat delivering it and I was on some type of sport fish boat delivering it. Obviously, we were going to two different customers. And it was getting dark. And I remember running south in the Chesapeake Bay and finding this boat floating out of gas in the Chesapeake Bay. It was getting cold. And the operator in it was Chris. And he had wrapped himself in a towel because it was starting to get cold. And that was probably the first moment in my evolution of working with him that I thought, you know, at this moment, I'm the alpha dog, not him. Because I had the option of towing home or not. <laughs> well, I've been hired one more time and I've been fired. So that's one good memory. Uh, trips I took with my family, which was always on a dealer stock boat, but trips I took with my family up the bay when I was a child, I'll never forget those. And I hope I can do those with my children because that really did mean a lot to me. Some of the other good times with my dad have been our racing background. We always had fun racing together, um, whether it be sailboats or powerboats or cars. Interesting, one weekend back in the late 90s, I was racing stock cars in Virginia. My dad was out racing drag cars in the western part of Virginia, and Earl was off racing boats in Missouri. We were all racing on the same weekend in three different locations. It's been kind of a wild, a wild and crazy racing career for us. So those are some of the fun times. A couple of years ago, we were having our annual sales company meeting. And you got to remember, all that we do, um, I'm into sales. That's, I'm not a broker today, but I'm selling. I'm selling in my life. I just believe in what we do. And so I'm selling the company. I'm selling the boats. I'm selling. And I love it. And I'm probably until I can't say another word, I'm going to be doing that. But for many, many years, I tried to, to instill in my son the reward and the pleasure of doing that. And he, he, was, uh, he was always a part of it, but he wasn't at the level that, that I felt like he should be. And so that was, I don't want to say it was a disappointment, but it, uh, it was something that I still worked at. So a couple of years ago, we were having our awards dinner and we gave out the, the Top Gun Awards. And my son, who in the last few years has 
all of a sudden decided to take a, a higher road and to work harder and to work smarter and to live and love what he does, which he does, he was the top guy. And nobody told me. I mean, I was absolutely floored. And yeah, I was really proud. Uh, but I was, you know, that really had a wonderful impact and a wonderful, that's a story that I would, that I would tell you because I love to share. And uh, he ain't done. He's, uh, and it gives me a, a better feeling to know that my family and our key people are going to, when I'm not here, and nobody's got any guarantees of, uh, you know, we're on a racetrack, so to speak, but you don't know which track, how big is it? So it's a good feeling to know that you have instilled into the people you care about those, those standards. I've had numerous people ask me from time to time questions like, do you look forward to, to Chris's retirement? And, and so I think that my answer would surprise them, but I have tremendous respect for Chris. And so my answer was, I hope he never retires. And they're like, well, why is that? And I said, well, as long as Chris runs the numbers of this company, we'll never go broke. Chris and I have a very unique relationship. We've each contributed to this company in, in two very distinct, different ways, yet working for a common goal. Um, I've tended to be the more hands-on guy, but Chris has always managed the finances of this company not only with an iron hand, but with a brilliant mind. Blue Order is successful today because of Chris Hall. And I, I think there are a lot of people who would say the same thing. I never dreamed that I would live this life and that I would live it with Chris. Um, it's remarkable. Good remarkable. I told Judy one day that my absolute dream would be to sit on the dock out here with uh, with all of the, the people that are close to us and watch every boat we've ever sold in 50 years come by. And I think all of them would wave. And I hope they would. Uh, but I would say thank you to all the people for their friendship, for their obviously their business, for their support, for their promotion of, of what we do. And I, I don't know how to even single anybody out of that. I mean, the, the people that were the, the employees, the, just everybody that's been a part of this journey that we've been on for 50 years, um, I just want to thank them all.